All right, we'll begin. Thanks for showing up to this week's storage provider meetup. We've got a lot to cover this week, so hopefully going to try and move fast. Uh, we will have a guest on in a bit, uh, but I'm going to start off uh, just myself. So I hope all of you are paying attention to the social media tab in our Discord. Uh, and if not, then I hope that that's because you follow us on Twitter or Facebook or whatever your preferred property is directly. Because uh, for the last two days, uh, we've tweeted out part one and part two of an article that uh, I myself have put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into. And I've had assistance from other uh, community members as well in or stakeholders. So if you played a hand in helping make these articles come together, thank you. Uh, but I'd just like to kind of start off this week's provider meetup by giving an overview of what these articles were. Um, I hope all of you take the time to read them on your own, but uh, I think there's value in uh, kind of giving a verbal uh, overview, and I think it'll help us establish a nice foundation for the rest of the call. So these articles, part one and two, uh, we titled The Distributed Storage Competition. So this is a piece that we've kind of wanted to have for a long time. It's something that we felt was missing. Uh, that wasn't quite offered in in a nice, um, tight, uh, and kind of high effort and well researched article. So this piece, uh, this article, it overviews various different uh, networks in the distributed storage space. So a lot of those are like crypto storage networks, um, but they all work a little bit differently. So the ones that we picked out as uh, kind of main peers or competitors or just doing something kind of similar to what we're doing uh, with SC Prime and XNet services. We identified uh, SIA, Filecoin, Arweave, and Storage as uh, the main networks that people typically compare us to and who we kind of regard as uh, potential, potential peers, I suppose. So these articles, um, part one, which is <laughs> probably where you should start, uh, we kind of begin with introducing who we are and, uh, and what we're up to. And then we dive into a table. So this is something that I can't really describe verbally what a table is, but or uh, I can't really regurgitate to you all the all the information. That'd be pretty boring. But we kind of go over uh, like the white paper and mainnet dates for all the different networks. Uh, so that's a way to kind of see roughly the age of the networks, uh, kind of when they began. Uh, you get to see side by side all the different market caps at, uh, at a fully diluted rate. Uh, full dilution uh, was a little complicated because some of the networks have uh, are on different like timelines and uh, our network and size as well uh, is technically an uncapped supply, but there is kind of a point where the block reward hits the minimum and then it just continues on at a very low reward. So we kind of treated that as uh, when our full dilution is reached. Uh, we can also kind of compare directly against each other the size of the networks and and a couple other things as well. So I'll uh, I'll start getting to the gist of it. Um, the the kind of TLDR of the table is that Filecoin is huge. They have a a lot of capacity and storage. They also have a huge valuation. Um, SC Prime we compare favorably in some metrics. So we have a pretty large network. Uh, we have a huge amount of storage nodes. Uh, we have a lot of capacity, um, but a modest amount of usage and our valuation is quite a bit below a lot of the other networks here as well. Uh, some other standouts. So storage uh, has a pretty decent amount of usage actually. So that kind of stands out from the others. Um, something like our weave comparably the opposite direction. They actually don't have very much, only 92 terabytes on the whole network, uh, but we'll, dive a little bit more into why that is. So uh, the network then kind of goes on, or the article kind of then goes on to just kind of covering who we are and what we're doing. Uh, so obviously we are SC Prime um, and we're the same team behind Xanet services and Xaminer as well. Uh, this is kind of a coordinated uh, multi-brand front uh, to encompass the different aspects of the network. So SC Prime is the underlying network and then Xaminer kind of covers the host side and Xnet services covers the runter side of the network. And this is how we're able to uh, take on all of these different aspects um, with kind of targeted branding and advertising and, and there's not much overlap. So if you're looking more into renting and you're not that interested in hosting, then you're not getting hit with a ton of stuff that doesn't really pertain to you. Uh, but obviously we, we do interweave a lot of uh, messaging between our different brands because things do synergize nicely. 
Um, and I think we had a discussion internally uh, actually earlier this week about how we kind of think of the Examiner and Xnet services as kind of our children. Um, but instead of children that fight and and struggle against each other, they're kind of children that actually uh, like help each other and coordinate. And when one does better, um, that helps the other. So that's cool as well. Uh, one thing that uh, I, d I decided to take on as well with this article, I covered some of the tokenomics for the different networks. So for those who are a little unfamiliar with that term, uh, tokenomics discusses, or it's kind of the, um, the term for the economics of tokens, I suppose. Well, that's where the word comes from. But it has to do with uh, different supply dynamics. So uh, if you were looking into, for a blockchain or, or any token, you're looking into the supply, how is that supply allocated, how are new tokens minted, that kind of thing. That's all kind of under the umbrella of tokenomics. So I decided to uh, dive in a little bit to tokenomics as well. So our network, we do have kind of a soft cap of about 55 million coins. Um, one thing that kind of differs us from some of the other networks that I'll get into in a bit is that we didn't have a huge pre-mine, um, like probably less than 10% of the, of the total supply was kind of in our control. And even of that, uh, most of the tokens that were in our control were earmarked for, uh, for like network incentives and providers. So those ultimately didn't go to us and we couldn't really like, well, frankly, we couldn't sell them, which is what something like a lot of ICOs at the time were trying to do. Um, so yeah, for actual funds that were specifically earmarked for team monetization, that was very little, like under a million. Um, most of it went out to the network and even still just of the pre-mine in general, uh, much smaller than a lot of the other peers. But now I'll get into the part two of the article, which is where we actually dive into each network in particular. So I'll kind of give a high level overview. Uh, if you're interested in any one of these networks or you're already kind of familiar with it and you want to see how it compares in this write-up, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, once again, the links are in the social media tab and we tweeted them out, so they shouldn't be too hard to find. It's also on the SC Prime website now. If you go to the main SC Prime website, there's a little articles uh, tab in the top right. So if you head there, you'll find them as well. So they're not too hard to find. So the first one that we began with was the SIA network. So this is one that uh, we're perhaps the most closely compared to, and that's because uh, we have a lot of uh, technical similarities because we both adopted, or we both use the renter host protocol, um, which was originally developed by SIA, by the way. So SIA kind of started out as uh, something kind of like Bitcoin for storage. Um, they started out on a Bitcoin forum, so that uh, definitely played an impact and, and an influence early on. Uh, and to kind of summarize in a sentence or two, size kind of deal. Uh, they were one of the first large networks in the space. Uh, they grew to a decent size by kind of 2016 and 17. But uh, since then, they've um, they've still kind of stayed in somewhat of a proof of concept state. Uh, and their network actually has been declining. Um, so they've, yeah, I don't know. If you want to look more closely into what they've been doing lately, you can do that. But mainly... Uh, we kind of compared differences in approach. So because we both use the renter host protocol, what I thought was most compelling or most interesting was some of the differences between our implementations. So we approached with these, this idea of having a kind of Xnet services, being able to provide services to the network so you can rent storage and um, be able to harness all the power of our network without having to actually get into crypto custody and manage the contracts and everything yourself. Um, we also leaned more into uh, having mass parallelization. So uh, that's kind of covered more in the Erasure Code article, but basically our network is higher performance, not only because we have mon uh, like far more nodes than theirs does, but because uh, our renter is much more able to uh, distribute across those nodes readily and you get uh, far more parallelis parallelization going on than on their network. So performance is better. Um, our capacity and, and storage node count is much higher. Um, and I think if you compare side by side our kind of approaches and our architectures, we compare pretty favorably. And part of that is because we've had uh, the experience of being able to watch their network grow and see what worked, what didn't work. So we've done some things differently, uh, having 
uh, the benefit of that kind of hindsight on their network. So the next one up is Filecoin. Uh, this is probably where I spent most of, or th this was probably the single project that I actually had to research the most, and that's because so many just little aspects of their network are just kind of frankly weird or seemingly needlessly complex, but uh, I definitely tried to keep a professional tone in the article. That's one thing that um, was clear that there was a need to be from the start. Um, so I, yeah, I tried to just kind of highlight the facts and say everything kind of as it is. I don't think there's really much in the article that could be disputed. Um, I just kind of highlighted, yeah, how things are. So Filecoin, uh, the gist of Filecoin is that it is the incentive layer for IPFS. So IPFS itself is a separate protocol that has to do with kind of web, uh, or it has to do with uh, addressing of like web content and storage um, itself. So IPFS is a protocol that can be used like separately and, and without Filecoin. But if you run an IPFS gateway, uh, you have to kind of deal with the billing and, and the charging um, of funds yourself. And that's um, that's kind of what Filecoin was created to, to handle. So Filecoin is a monetization layer of IPFS, which is a separate protocol. So it, that being said, it's kind of important to understand what IPFS is. So IPFS is kind of best suited to like websites and NFTs and like any public data sets. So the kind of recurring theme across these is that it's data that's intended to be like accessed or shared broadly uh, with no real need for authentication or complex permissioning or anything like that. Um, and what IPFS is probably not very well suited to is something like a like a storage backup or sensitive documents or um, like media or anything kind of where high performance is required because IPFS is not a terribly performant uh, protocol. It's not really something that that was uh, that wasn't really in the design from the start. It was mostly to kind of handle Web three stuff, and a lot of Web three stuff doesn't really factor in performance. So. If you're looking to use Filecoin, you kind of have to understand what IPFS is and some of its limits. So on tokenomics specifically, Filecoin probably has the most interesting case for tokenomics. So as I kind of referenced earlier, Filecoin is, uh, of these networks that we're kind of looking at, Filecoin is by far the highest valuation. So their, um, their market cap as it kind of stands today with the existing supply and, and uh, cold wallets that have had the time lock already go, is about 1.4 billion. Uh, but once again, if you kind of go with the full dilution, uh, they come up to a colossal like 11 and a half billion. And that's just because there's so much supply that uh, is either time locked and um, well, a lot of their supply ha is time locked and hasn't yet been unlocked. So that means there's a lot of supply coming, but doesn't exist yet. So yeah, their fully diluted value is like 11 billion, which is pretty huge. Um, but today it is just a portion of that. But anyway, so the gist is on Filecoin, there's 2 billion total tokens and something like 900 million of those, so like 45% of the supply is actually either like owned, uh, distributed or managed by um, the founders. So the founders are kind of split across protocol labs and Filecoin foundation. But there was, yeah, essentially like a 900 million token pre-mine um, a lot of that is time locked, but um, the time lock is mostly on a like six year linear uh, unlocking. So we're already a couple years into that. So they already have a pretty substantial portion of those tokens. And I think, let me check, the Filecoin price today is $4.33. So 900 million tokens. So yeah, they have something like $4 billion <laughs> in, uh, in tokens for themselves, which is pretty huge. Um, which is not unusual in crypto. Um, that's, yeah, I'm not really going to make a huge commentary on that or, or judge because uh, every time that we in the past maybe kind of have started to make some insinuations or some comments or pass judgment on uh, networks like Filecoin, they get to do this thing called running scoreboard. And what a running scoreboard is, is they basically hear what you say and then they just point to their market cap. They point to the amount of like headlines that they make, they get to basically just point to all of the metrics in which they're better than you. And that just shuts you up because 
sure they might be having four billion dollars in a pre-mine but um clearly the market doesn't really care that much or they wouldn't it wouldn't be worth four billion so that's just kind of a thing and running scoreboard is pretty common in this space um so anyway getting into the actual mechanics of filecoin itself so that, that was a lot on tokenomics um i'll just kind of touch on how filecoin actually works um so yeah as i alluded to the performance isn't great on it you also can't use it with any s3 apps which isn't fun <laughs> isn't isn't great um because S3 is pretty important for enabling kind of existing workflows to be able to work over or work natively on uh, on your network without having to completely reinvent the wheel. Uh, but that is something that Filecoin kind of expects. I think there there is a layer that's working on a S3 compatibility for Filecoin, uh, but it's not it's not really a thing yet. Uh, and when that day comes, I don't know how closely it'll actually resemble. Uh, something that an enterprise would find acceptable. So another thing that's pretty different, Filecoin miners uh, cost a huge amount of money. So we're all kind of used to exa miners, which are pretty small. They don't pull a lot of power. And mostly what it's doing is just kind of hosting storage in hard drives over the internet. Uh, and there isn't really a need for a lot of power in that. It's not doing a lot of number crunching or anything. Uh, but Filecoin miners are doing significant amounts of number crunching. Uh, they are kind of more traditional miners, or like blockchain or crypto miners so these things are expensive they pull a ton of power like even more so than gpu mining um yeah the like you need like 256 gigs of ram or more in order to like mine filecoin and actually have a decent chance of earning anything it's pretty absurd uh and this isn't just bad and it, well this isn't just kind of unfriendly to um consumers but it's also uh, like practically it does limit uh, the amount of nodes that you can have in the network. It limits kind of where those nodes can be. Uh, and that kind of goes against a lot of the, the notions of a distributed cloud where they can be kind of set up in any old like closet or back room anywhere in the world and provide storage that can be kind of pop up uh, dynamically. So I think that is kind of a weakness, but that is uh, that being a weakness is more of a commentary that I'm adding here. Uh, and not so much in the in the article. The article stuck pretty to the facts. So, anywho, uh, kind of moving on to Arweave. So Arweave is a bit of a different beast. Uh, I won't talk too much about this one. I kind of alluded to it earlier as its network is only like 90 something terabytes. Uh, that's because Arweave is primarily targeting NFTs and the way that they like store the actual data is they store the data on the blockchain itself, not on uh, they don't have like storage providers that create uh, like smart contracts and then you store the data and I pay you and then um, all of that is settled on the blockchain. On our weave, the data is actually in the blockchain itself, which is kind of weird, uh, but it's kind of working out for them. And they also have a pr pretty decent valuation. Let's see. Our weave fully diluted market cap, 600 million. So uh, yeah, they're not exactly small either, uh, but they're doing something a bit kind of different. Personally, I don't think that their model is great. I think our kind of model or, or something that more resembles our model of having, um, using the blockchain to handle the, the kind of settlement and the terms of the smart contract, but not actually having the, the data on the blockchain itself. I think that that's a much more scalable and, and versatile solution. Uh, but they're, that's kind of working out for them. And to an extent they get to run scoreboard as well and say, Hey, you know, it's fine that you don't think this is the best way to do it, but we're worth way more than you are. So yeah, and then, then then when they run scoreboard, not much you can say back. Anyway, lastly, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and kind of speed this up here because we have so much else to talk about, but storage, uh, they're probably the one that most resembles our network, um, as in they are also kind of targeting enterprise. Uh, they do have S3 compatibility, but uh, they're on their tokenomics. They had even larger. I think they had the largest pre-mine actually of the networks that we looked at. They had like a 57% pre-mine, um, of which they still have like 45%, which is pretty huge. Um, and one of the biggest departures that they take from the other networks is that they don't actually have a blockchain. Um, a storage is just a Ethereum token. Uh, when it comes to the actual like storage proofs and settlements and all that, 
Uh, none of that is done in a decentralized or distributed manner. Those are all just running on storage's tokens. The only thing that kind of involves crypto is that they pay you using a Ethereum token. So yeah, I think it would be fair to say that they're not decentralized in any of the ways that really matter. Uh, but that's, I guess, for you to kind of feel if that's important. I, I think that's important, but um, just kind of putting that out there. And I suppose, once again, to an extent, they get to kind of run scoreboard because they're diluted market cap, uh, like close to 200 million. Um, so they can kind of hear our criticism and then just point to the scoreboard and say, yep, but we're worth more than you. So <laughs> isn't that fun? Anyway, uh, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, I did kind of come to a conclusion at the end that everybody, like all of all these networks, they agree that uh, distributed cloud is awesome and a brilliant concept. Uh, but everybody kind of sees and envisions that a little bit differently and and approaches that problem a little bit differently. Uh, I, f I definitely encourage you to actually read this article. It isn't that long. I know it looks intimidating, but there's big graphics and those take up space and it, it isn't that bad. I, I think it's uh, I think it'll make a lot of sense to you. I definitely encourage you to um, plumb part one and part two. I think you'll learn a lot and it'll be interesting. And I think you'll come away from it understanding uh, where we're, what we're doing and where we're coming from a lot more. So, awesome. So that was tweeted out uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, I think today and, and yesterday, those were tweeted out. Um, so that was kind of topic one of today. Topic two, let me see if I have my guest in the room. So we have Hello. Psychotics with us on the stage. How's it going? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you. So uh, just before we dive into um, what's going on today, I just wanted to kind of touch that, uh, well, the, the kind of theme of, of this next little segment will be kind of on the relayer and what it's doing and some of what it's achieving. So I just wanted to put out there that uh, the relayer is entering, entering a really exciting phase of its kind of development where it's more into kind of validation type stuff or we're doing a lot more validation type work. So that includes kind of app, uh, in, like testing and integrations and stuff uh, for workflows with S3 apps. It also means that uh, there's a pretty large entity. Um, I don't know how much I can really say about them. Uh, I would love to s spill everything, but I'll just say that there's a large entity out there that we have a connection with uh, and have had a connection with for a little while now. And they are taking the relayer kind of internally and running it through the paces and validating it. And we're expecting some feedback from them. Um, so that's kind of underway now, and that's exciting. Um, that's hopefully something that at the end of it, we'll be able to name who it was, but I don't think I could say that today. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of establish that, that we are uh, giving the relayer out to various partners and interested parties. And some of them are pretty big names that have worked on projects that you would definitely have heard of. So that's cool. So I brought my friend, uh, well, his username is Psychotics. You've maybe seen him around, but uh, your name is Patrick, right? Can Correct, I call you sir. that? Yeah, great. So I, I feel a little, now, now that you've heard our voices and we're a little more human-like, I feel a little better calling you Patrick rather than calling you a psycho every time. <laughs> no, I'm good with that. So, uh, Patrick, can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit and uh, maybe explain how you came to be uh, working on, well, working on relayer stuff and how you got to this stage today? Yeah, sure. So, uh, like Henry said, my name is Patrick. Um, uh, this is not what I do in my normal day job. Um, I'm uh, usually focused in basic science research. And in another life, I've done a lot of, like, Linux security work and just systematically, like, deconstructing things. And um, just as a hobbyist, taking things apart and seeing how things work. Um, so I happened upon the um, this particular project, like a lot of folks did back in that that big influx of, of folks from January that um, you know caused a flood of flood of folks that have joined the project uh, for the better, in my opinion, and just you know starting to use the products and as they've they've been released and. I'm uh, just trying to wrap my head around how everything works and, and really just through my own kind of self-discovery 
on uh, in my own my own interest, uh, right? So I have uh, been playing around with the relayer, and um, I guess one of my strengths is that I can kind of evolve the way I communicate uh, based off of who it is that I'm you know, working with. So obviously dealing with clients or people that are new to Linux uh, or even just communicating with the developers is a kind of a wide audience of folks and everybody kind of has a different level of comfort um, and obviously the information that they need. And so that's one of the things that I've just been kind of, as I've been playing with stuff, tossing out like what I found uh, things that I think that developers might find is is helpful information on on a level that they might that they might understand. That's obviously different than what maybe the the, the clients that people using it might understand. And and a lot of this comes from an area where I I really want to see the project succeed. And if this is a way that I can help contribute um, through um, finding and playing around with different things and coming up with different scenarios that people might deploy these products, then that's how I kind of got involved. Yeah, and we're very thankful that you did. Um, so at this point, uh, we're kind of working together on, well, kind of the umbrella that it falls under, I guess you could call it kind of S3 integration. Uh, but more specifically, well, I guess before we dive into that, uh, kind of what is, well, I mean, I know the answer to this, but uh, for the benefit of our audience, what is kind of S3 integration and, and why is that important? And what is it allow uh, that maybe wouldn't otherwise yeah so just a just a caveat i'm not an s3 expert just like a lot of you guys um out there you know i'm using the different technologies that are out there and s3 is one of the big players um in terms of the different protocols that are available for for file storage so um and that and that's that's one big takeaway is that s3 in and of itself is not an app it's a protocol and it was created originally by amazon and everyone else has kind of been trying to recreate and standardize that protocol and and minio was one of the big third-party tools that that came up in an effort to help standardize that protocol and as you can imagine, it doesn't take without saying that AWS is is massive. And so a lot of the different applications that have been developed out there um, already inherently are being created to work with platforms like AWS. And then there are other ones out there that you guys might have heard of, like Backblaze or Wasabi. And these are all using like S3 compatible layers. Um, and one of the, the the neat things about the relayer and and why it's important that S3 is such an important topic here is that there is a lot of applications that are out there already that exist um, that have S3 compatibility natively built into it because they're designed to work with a lot of the other big players in this in, in this area. So without having to then go to each one of these individual applications and say, hey, will you support this particular network now, you can say, well, if you're already using these applications, it's a seamless transition for you to move your data from one network to the other. Um, and so that's kind of where S3 is and why it's important and from a compatibility standpoint, why it's a good interface for this type of network. Yeah, that was, a, that was an awesome summary. Uh, thank you for plumbing that a bit. Um, I'll now kind of pivot a bit and talk about so enterprise usage um, which I think you, you might have a bit of experience with once again um, not all of this is exactly your day job but I think you have a pretty good sense and uh, and I think you could speak to it as well so typical uh, IT kind of infrastructure and setups that use cloud services uh, there is my understanding is that there's kind of a variety of uh, options for how you might deploy something uh, like perhaps a native app sometimes that has a UI and then other times um, maybe kind of more of a container based and CLI. So these options that are kind of fairly typical in industry, uh, where is the relayer today kind of in that uh, in that offering? Where are we now? Kind of a loaded question because you're right. It, you know, a lot of these kind of applications really run the spectrum. So in some cases, it is at the CLI level. You know, for for certain applications, um, 
and and different storage appliances that might exist within the enterprise and then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum you, you, there is a lot of like point and click type of 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 applications that kind of live on that layer so uh, the relayers is, is the kind of the kind of tool um that really can live anywhere um depending upon how you secure it just like any other uh, appliance you put it up in the cloud you know you would secure it just like any other server that that you would put up um likewise if it lived on prem um in in my kind of vision at least for like the industry that i'm in it's the type of thing where i would see where it would inherently live on prem um likely within you know our particular data center and that would allow us a lot more feasibility to um scale things a bit more so if we needed to bring more relayers on and and put them behind load balancers etc cetera, etc cetera. um right now as the relayers you guys see it um there's the kind of all-in-one package that you know has the the ui front end to it to kind of simplify your your life um on on running things on the back end but i do know uh, that that there are other things that you guys are working on too to kind of allow the flexibility for people to deploy the relayer that kind of makes sense for your industry or your your particular um organization so if you wanted to develop your own front end you could um or if you wanted to kind of just run it bare bones down to the cli level and and control it that way you could so that i think that's one of the power pieces of the relayer and definitely the direction that the relayer is going is that right now it seems like there's kind of a solution for um you know maybe small organizations that might not have an it you know arm that they could lean on and then conversely on the completely opposite end of the spectrum if you have a team of developers that wanted to really kind of customize the experience you could do that too yeah awesome so i'll ask you this um since we're kind of working on s3 kind of integration and compatibility and, and just kind of more uh broad industry support and making things as kind of native and work as expected as possible um in your efforts and in your kind of testing thus far uh, have there been any kind of issues that you've identified or things that you found that uh, could be tweaked or changed and what was the uh, what was the resolution or what was the path uh, for that can you think of an example yeah so um, there's definitely I mean just like any piece of, of software there's there's always going to be bumps and 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 pivots to a certain extent um, and one of the things that uh, initially came up in my testing and, and really was the gateway to me kind of doing more uh, relayer testing stuff was that I, I had initially started playing around with our clone well even taking a step further than that is that um, as a hobbyist I, I have a true nas um, uh, file server and it's basically for those of you that don't know it's an open source piece of software that um, where you can create your own network attack storage and it's got a really cool ui overlay and everything and they've got two different platforms one trunos core which is based off of freebsd uh, which is a, a, a unix um, operating system similar to linux but distant cousins um, and and that's kind of like where their platform originally had, had started and now they've come out with another product called true not scale which is linux based and um and a lot of this has to do with the fact that it uses a zfs file system as is kind of like the underlying stuff so rather than talking too much about that um one of the other things that's built into this is the ability to, to attach cloud credentials and and uh, you can pick different buckets and and the different um pieces of your data that you want to back up so like me personally i had been using backblaze to back up my my crucial important stuff you know family photos etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so i said hey i got this relay running on my network it, technically it should be plug and play because of the whole s3 endpoint stuff i'm going to go ahead and, and try this and sure enough because i had already had the relay stood up on uh within my network it was incredibly seamless for me to point you know to my s3 endpoint of where my relayer lives and everything started syncing well 
now getting to your original question, where I started to notice some some particular issues was is that the amount of data that I was uploading was considerably more than the data that I thought I was uploading. And it really it came down to the fact of of one of the S3 implementations of of the way the the syncing is able to check if the file that's already been uploaded um, is actually uploaded. Um, and with the way that MinIO was responding, it wasn't responding with the information that Arclone was expecting. So every time Arclone would run in the background on my TrueNOT system, it was doing a complete re-upload of, of all of the data. And so sending, you know, communicating with the team and sending, they, this is what I found and yada, yada, yada. Um, essentially, one of the things that looks like it's been identified is, is just the way some of the, the user provided metadata. So for example, MD5 checksums, uh, modification times of the original file, things that you typically would need for, as a response from the server to say, hey, this file is actually the same, skip it, don't re-upload it. Um, is is one of the things that it looks like is is actively being worked on with the developers now so we can do things like syncing data uh, which is what a lot of people will probably use the relayer for initially in backing up an archival data that would make sense that you don't want to re-upload all of your old data you only want to upload the differences and and so that's one one thing that i noticed initially out the gate that that you guys are working on now to uh, kind of help resolve, and and that'll bring you guys one step closer to, um, you know, just more S3 compatibility. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you for explaining for that. Thank you for explaining that for us, and thank you for your efforts as well on uh, kind of seeing a way that the relayer could be used in your life, and then uh, trying it out and uh, communicating so well with us, and being able to uh, being willing to work with us on. Uh, kind of improving the relayer and yeah like like you kind of said I, I like how transparent you are about you are kind of invested in this project and if this is the way that you can uh, help contribute and improve maybe your own situation as well uh, so you would benefit from having a, an app like this uh, and you're willing to put in kind of the effort and, and time to help uh, make it the way that you want it then that's awesome so thank you yeah yeah, and I just want to kind of like reiterate for anybody that's out there too that if you guys, you know, obviously not everybody's got, you know, a uh, um, bottomless pit of money to, to to throw toward stuff. But in many cases, if you have time and you have the the skills and the resources too, and you like to tinker like I do, um, you know, I, I'm always I'm always down to to work with other individuals that that have the same kind of passions as as myself and and i'm sure you guys are all here because you're you're vested in in making sure that this project succeeds and 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 this is how it my takeaway of is is that this is the one way that i can contribute to to kind of help keep pushing the ball forward yeah awesome thank you and i i do expect uh at some point we might get to have you up on the stage again and maybe hear an update to uh, some of the efforts that we're working on now yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I do want to add that, you know, I have, there are up, other applications that I have tested. So like we've, I've tested Mountain Duck, I've tested NextCloud, um, uh, and then I've got a list of things that are, are, that are, that are popular out there like Veeam and Duplicati that kind of all on my to-do list and, and kind of as we squash some of these, these other bugs, um, that'll be the, one of the next things I tackle. So no short list of things to do. Awesome. Great work. Thank you. Appreciate it. So uh, we're pretty close at this point to moving to the very exciting and announcement-filled part of this week's meetup. Um, so Ken should be joining me on the stage soon. Uh, but just while that's happening, I have uh, one last kind of cool, interesting bit that I can talk about. So we've alluded over the last couple of months that we've been doing lots of testing on the relayers themselves. So um, kind of measuring and and just trying out a bunch of different stuff and uh, I mean I mean there's so much I mean testing is so open ended <laughs> but uh, some of the some of the testing that we've been looking forward to the most has definitely been regarding kind of upload speeds so upload speeds has been something that we prioritized pretty early on uh, one of the early kind of use cases that we saw as most compelling for the relayer and for our service in general was kind of large data set, uh, kind of like backup type stuff. So 
for that, it's obviously the most important to kind of upload it as, uh, as quickly as possible and kind of get it out of your network um, and onto the cloud so you don't have to wait around. And particularly if it is a backup type thing, those are typically pretty large. So um, being able to upload quickly would definitely save you some time. So uh, yeah, upload speeds we've been able to kind of measure. Um, and if I switch over to that tab, yeah, I can share that uh, we finished some VPS testing. So on a 32 core, 128 gig of RAM machine um, that we rented specifically for some of this testing uh, on a relayer, uh, we were able to do some kind of short sprints of uh, kind of averaging seven and a half gigabit and peaking as high as 10 gigabit uh, speeds and then a kind of multi-hour sustained throughput test um, we're able to average like six to six and a half gigabit uh, also with some kind of short spurts um, kind of like eight to ten gigabit type stuff and on that same machine uh, using aws cli so that is uh, aws which is obviously a traditional cloud provider uh, using their native kind of command line uh, service uh, and using not just using default settings because it turns out the default settings were actually kind of slow but uh, we went in and, and tuned it and so we had kind of a generous um, we were generous in how we measured AWS but the gist of it is that AWS hit about four gigabit uh, on that same machine uh, and that wasn't some kind of weird case where we were like the VPS that we rented was in like Australia and then we were trying to upload to Virginia or something it wasn't anything like that uh, this was a pretty standard um, like pretty standard configuration and we had AWS we tried it a bunch of times with different settings and we went with the one that uh, worked most performantly same with the relayer so this wasn't some kind of like we didn't stack the deck or anything um, the relayer really was just like almost essentially twice as fast as uh, AWS was on the same machine. So that was pretty cool. Uh, we also kind of, well, we, we measured a lot around that as well. Uh, we measured the scalability. Uh, so if you up the amount of like upload workers, the effect that that has, uh, these kinds of things, uh, memory usage. So yeah, pretty much everything that could be measured, we did measure. Um, which I think makes a lot of sense. And that's the kind of culture that we're hoping to foster uh, in our organization that we want to measure everything because um, there's so much to be learned about our own product and um, that could help focus efforts. And it also creates a wealth of resources as well that we could share with our partners um, and for like third party use as well. So they have some kind of reference material. So uh, in the future, we're kind of working on, well, we're always working on uh, improving speeds, but our upload speeds today, we're pretty happy with, um, those will continue to get better, but where we're doing a lot of, where we're focusing a lot of energy right now on, uh, since initially we kind of focused on improving and refining the upload speeds, like I alluded to earlier, uh, where we are today is that we're approaching and we're, uh, kind of deep, pretty deep into the process of speeding up, uh, the download speed. So. I think we have a couple uh, sprints identified already. We've already done one or two of them uh, for up increasing and uh, helping make the download speed as competitive as possible. And what's pretty exciting is that in, in some of the testing anyway, even just with one or two of several sprints complete for download testing, is that download testing is already faster than upload testing. Um, so some of the download speeds that we've been hitting are really uh, groundbreaking and are already very competitive with, if not straight up better and faster than traditional cloud services. And this is something that because of the dynamic and scalable nature of our cloud, uh, we're able to deliver to pretty much any corner of the world uh, without needing uh, some kind of special direct connects or any, um, any kind of weird industry, uh, things like that, or, or proximity to data centers. Uh, which I think if you're doing enterprise networking at a certain scale, that makes sense. But um, yeah, just the, the fact that our distributed cloud is able to kind of focus and bring regional storage providers to any corner of the earth, uh, we can bring these speeds, not just to people who are near existing data centers, like with traditional cloud, but we can bring it anywhere. Uh, and for anyone on 
either special hardware or non-special hardware. So that's awesome to see. And I think that that's very validating to our hypotheses that we made early on about the power of kind of a distributed mesh cloud and how parallelizing all of these workflows and, and pipelines, uh, the, the, the efficiencies that are had through all of that are things that we identified pretty early on. And now we're, yeah, we're able to kind of validate all of that. And I think it's, uh, really awesome. I know that that got a very warm reception within the team, um, that everybody felt like a lot of their hard work and the, the things that they'd been working on and kind of making bets on that hadn't necessarily been validated up till then uh, suddenly were. So that's awesome to see. And definitely an indication, uh, if nothing else, this is an indication that the direction that we're heading with our cloud is not only the right one, but uh, is the path toward pushing higher and, and pushing the envelope even further than traditional cloud could ever reach. So that's very exciting. Now I am sharing the stage with, uh, with Ken, who has some uh, very exciting and interesting news to share with us all. Um, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm pretty good. That's uh, freaking amazing what you just went over. Um, I, I would just highlight that what you're describing, even though we've done a little bit, our engineers have done a little bit of tweaking and tuning um, to get that, you know, and we've obviously developed this really cool um, abstraction of erasure coding that's different than the other guys um, to, to, to achieve this a little closer whenever I look at it to, to BitTorrent. But the thing that's really interesting is we haven't really got in there and done that really, you know, heavy duty fine tuning. And we haven't really pushed out into a lot of areas that we know that we still can. And we're already beating the other guys like a drum, <laughs> right? And so like if you, if you go to AWS and you want to upload a whole bunch of data to Corp, you've got a bunch of petabytes of data. One of the things that they do is they steer you to their snowball um, line of products, which are, you know, devices that they send out to you, you load your data on them on a 10 G net connection and then turn around and they FedEx it back. Or if you've got a ton of it, they'll send a truck out and the truck will hook up. I mean, it's, it, and that's serious. And, you know, if we can continue to increase and, and separate ourselves in a performance, uh, metric like that from the traditional cloud vendors, this isn't going to be a contest for long. I mean, it just isn't because it costs a lot of money and bandwidth and time and energy when you start getting bogged down into these big data sets having to be transferred all over the place. So what, what's an example of what I'm talking about? Well, look, this whole thing is working right now on a relatively uh, mild network configuration. You know, almost everybody in, in, in the project you know, has a pretty standard internet connect, uh, you know, situation. So we're talking about, you know, as low as 30 megabit per second uh, uploads for a lot of providers. Maybe some people have 100. There might be a few people that are, you know, sitting on symmetrical one gig. But at the end of the day, most of it's low, right? Most of it's residential. And, and these units that are sitting in these houses are not, you know, supercomputers by any stretch. And most of them probably don't have more than a 1G card in them. So, you know, when we decide to, to really move into some of the next level stuff, when we start building computers that do have, you know, 10G cards in them, and we do start, you know, getting into NVMe rate situations, and we do start getting into big, big, big bandwidth connections, we're just going to blow the doors off everybody else because of the way this thing works. And then you start getting the proximity you know, where you get a company that's located in city A, and then all of a sudden, you know, we spin up a couple of Facebook geo-targeted geo ads and we get, you know, 100, 200, 400, 500 providers to spin up within 10 kilometers of that customer. And all of a sudden, there literally will not be a choice. You will end up having to choose us simply because of the performance uh, disparities that we're bringing to the table. And that's not even focused on price. Right. I mean, that's that's talking about going at them head to head. That's why I've always resisted when people talk about how we should like really get really aggressive on pricing, because to be frank about it, I think the thing we're building is better than the thing that they've already got built. But uh, anyway, thanks for having me here. Uh, I, I didn't want to miss the big announcement. Did I miss it already? 
Uh, no. I think uh, everyone's oh, sitting uh, pretty pretty eagerly, actually. Well, I'm I'm the big announcement. I, I've got the big announcement. So, sorry about that. I've got it right here. Hang on a second. Let me. I, I've got the envelope, and I'm going to open it up here, and and uh, we'll award the the grand prize. Um. So look, everybody knows where we're at, and and you know one of the things that I really want to reiterate to everybody is our gratefulness for you know this network that we've built. One of the things that I've said a few times recently. And I know things are really tough right now and they're getting tougher simply because of all the goofiness that's going on in the, the, the industry that we, you know, sort of are uh, tied to, to a degree. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this network that we've built is very strong and very robust. And, and, you know, I think ultimately this is the foundation that we are going to build off of. And from here on up, it's just going to get better and better and better. So, you know, we're really grateful for all of that. But one of the things that really has, you know, come along down the pipe is as we've got to this place, um, you know, we don't really fit in crypto. You know, we, we, we don't really have a place at this point, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we're not uh, 20-somethings for the most part. There, you know, there's a few of us here that are 20-something, but um, for the most part, we're not. And, and at the end of the day, um, we don't come from really, you know, uh, high-end research type backgrounds. You know, nobody on our team is from Stanford or MIT or anything like that. We're not, you know, uh, high-end cryptographers. You know, when we looked at the whole equation of this, we came at it from this other aspect of saying, well, yeah, we actually buy into the uh, rhetoric and the, the the PR that this is going to be world changing at some point in the future and there already exists a Vitalik Buterin and there already exists, you know, a Greg Maxwell and some of these other people that we stand on the shoulders of. Now is the time to start working on products. And what's been really interesting to watch is that, so I came in, well, I mean, I literally came in back in 2011, didn't fall down the rabbit hole, ultimately came back 2016, looked at it a little bit, didn't really start buying some mining equipment until 2017, and then rode that you know, wave up to the top and then rode all the way through the really hard bear of 2018. And we started in 2018, right about four years ago today. So, you know, the, the, the thing about it was, is that in that bear, that was all kind of a utility driven um, cycle. Yes, the, the crypto kitties existed. Yes, everybody was starting to pump on ICOs and do all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, the, the the coins that everybody had ridden up to the big crazy heights in 2017 and early 2018 were the utility coins and utility coins really had a lot of you know sort of feeling and of purported value but then everything got you know whacked all the way down to 90 and plus percentage higher and it got really tough and it was hard to really see it. And I guess there are people that did see it clearly because they owned, you know, uh, punks, for instance. But it was hard for me to see it. I didn't see it at all, to be honest with you. But then I was never really an F guy. But it was hard to see what happened in, in 2020 and 2021. I didn't really, uh, I wasn't able to see DeFi coming the way that it did and NFTs and all of the stuff that really didn't have much utility. Now, I know a lot of people We'll talk about NFT utility and, you know, the various things, football teams and stuff like that. But it, it's still really not there. And it, it's a long ways from being there. Some of the DeFi products definitely do shine the light towards the direction of what makes a lot of sense in distributed finance going forward. And I think there's going to be some good products that will shake out of that. But it's a long ways right now from product ready. So that was a research boom we just went through. But what happened was all the utility coins really didn't do very well, right? And a lot of them just disappeared, you know? So what ended up happening in this last boom is we, we thought we were well positioned, right? But it turned out we weren't positioned really at all. I mean, we, we couldn't really get a peek inside the tent. And because we aren't, you know, those 20-something um, cryptographer types and we weren't really into the Bintwit, uh, you know, type world, we didn't really have a lot of connections and we really didn't get out there and make a lot of those kinds of connections. So we found ourselves continuing to be on the outside looking in. Well, we didn't put a lot of energy into it. 
you know, we were too busy building our product and we knew what we had. And so we knew we had to just keep grinding on the product. Fortunately, what happened was, you know, we had raised a little bit of money, but because we weren't really those guys that I just mentioned, you know, for us to raise that first amount of money was very difficult. We couldn't really find anybody in the sphere to do it. So what we did is we found folks sort of mostly on the outside or even not even in the sphere and brought them in. But because they were not, you know, down the rabbit hole, so to speak, they were not, you know, fully bought into the story. It was a hard sell. You know, I made that sell 24 times, by the way. We have 24 angels on our cap table right now, and I made it 24 times. Now, I won't tell you how many times I got a no, but we did get 24 yeses. And the nice part about that was is that, you know, we did it really sort of, you know, on the strength of what we were building, not on the strength of, you know, oh, buy this and the crypto is going to do this and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, well, you see it now with all the FTX meltdown, how these people sort of believed when they bought into stuff. You know, they they thought that it was all going to be sort of insider traded and plumped up to wherever and blah, blah, blah. And that just really isn't anything we're about. Well, the downside to, you know, how we did it is that we couldn't really raise the kind of money that we probably needed for the product scale that we were building, the scope and scale. I mean, look, we're building something foundationally to take on Amazon, right? I mean, it's literally another Facebook if we do it right, you know? So um, for us to, you know, come walking away from original, you know, investment pre-seed of a million and a half, yeah, we're grateful. I mean, we're totally grateful we got that, that early money that kept us alive, um, but it wasn't enough and it wasn't even anywhere near enough. And we really had to sort of, scrape and 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 just work and grind to really kind of do whatever and then we did get a little bit of a bull run towards the end of 2021 that we did happen to participate a little bit in and there was some ability to do some additional things that ultimately you know put some more money on the table so that we could keep people employed and so we could actually get some more people onto the team and as I've said over and over and over again, uh, we've just assembled a ridiculous team. I don't, I, it's just such a great team for what we're doing. And they've been able to blow out really what is an amazing working product that hasn't had really any major hiccups, you know? So it, from top to bottom, we have delivered, right? And, and that's all I can ever say to anybody is that from top to bottom, we have just brought to the table everything we said we were going to do and more. And so now we're in this process where, you know, things are not looking so good, right? The whole macros melted down. Jerome's, you know, raised interest rates at the fastest rate ever in history. And essentially everybody's freaking out, trying to understand if they're going to try and force us into a great depression in order to avoid having this, uh, you know, inflation. We got half the world that seemingly wants to go to war with the other half of the world and that nobody knows what's going on. Um, but again, I look back at console.xns.tech and I see that map and that map looks really strong in the areas that we've really done a good job in focusing in, which is mostly Europe and mostly the USA. And it's really, really, really good to see what we've developed there. It's also really good to see that we really haven't built out anything in China yet or anything in Asia or anything in uh, South America for any reasonable amount. because those are all wide open spaces for us. And they're all places that we're definitely going to be able to, I think, drive networks where if you look at the Amazon and Microsoft maps, they, they don't exist today. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, I think we are, you know, in a really good place, but it's really kind of scary because with the macro doing what it's doing and all the uncertainty that's out there, we found ourselves coming to the end of our runway. Everything is essentially seized up for us. Um, we don't really have any other avenues uh, that are easy for us to acquire funds. And we've been out there talking with venture capitalists now to kind of do that whole thing of getting into a series seed. Um, and, you know, like everything else in the project, it's been a bit of a hard slog. Not because the VCs don't see what we've done, because the meetings have gone great. But it's really clear that everybody that shows up in those meetings 
has an initiative or a mandate right now to say, you know, we're probably not cutting a lot of big checks right now. We're, we're mostly in a wait and see mode to see how this whole thing sort of shakes out. And, you know, people are still kind of finishing up rounds that, you know, started back when the, the bowl was still running. But at this point, we think it's probably going to take a little while to find the right group of venture to come and do our thing. In fact, we actually got a guy uh, from a uh, uh, fund who primarily does Series A and up. And he looked at what we were doing and he said, you know what, you ought to just take the time, get audited financials. Just do what you're doing and go for a Series A right now. You're there. You might as well do it. You know, go get what money you need. Go get the $10, $20 million you actually need to pull this thing off. And there's a lot of vitamins in that, right? There's a lot of power there because the truth is, if we had that kind of money right now, I'm pretty sure we could spend it correctly in order to quickly get to where we need to be and take our place on the global stage. Um, but, you know, this project has a life of its own and it's going to do what it's going to do. So what we have to do is just sort of uh, plan for all sort of contingencies. And right now the contingency is, is that the plane is pretty low with altitude. And so we have to find another way or we have to find other ways in order to keep ourselves going. The worst thing that could happen right now is that the team could splinter and dissipate. Um, you know, obviously, there are, are a couple of people here that are, you know, hardcore and will be here no matter if there's no money for ever, <laughs> right? I, I certainly am that person. I worked for a year and a half without any salary here. And, you know, if I have to go back, I will. Um, but I can't ask that of some of these other guys. I just can't. And, you know, if we lose them, it's not going to be easy to get them back. And you can say, well, yeah, but, you know, Facebook's laying off everybody and Amazon's laying off and Elon's letting a bunch of people go. Yeah, but these people know this, you know, architecture inside and out now. They know this thing upside down. So the last thing we want to do is go out and have to reconstitute a team a year from now and let somebody else leapfrog us. And the ultimate uh, other side of that is, is that I need to actually add to the team right now. I've got eight or nine specific FTEs that I need to hire. And I'm just in a place right now where I can't do it. I just cannot put anybody else on the team. And in fact, probably starting to consider what the layoff looks like when it starts to come down the path. So some really good and some really bad in that situation. But I, I, I never come away from this stuff anything less than optimistic because I know what we've built. I know who we are. I know who you guys are now. And at the end of the day, I just, I don't see any way that this thing fails. I just don't. And, it, you know, we will lift heaven and earth to make sure that it doesn't. So what the big announcement today has to do with is primarily going to be uh, tied to this secondary token that exists on our chain called SPF. We haven't talked too much about SPF because... Well, a lot of reasons. It doesn't have a lot of utility. It doesn't really do much. It's just sort of a token that lives out there as a rent seeker. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing. And boy, if you can get them, it's great to have them. But at the end of the day, there really is no way um, for us to offer them on an exchange right now without a lot of expense overhead and so forth. And it's really, you know, part and parcel of everything else. We kind of need to wait for some regulatory clearance uh, clarity before we can go out and start putting them on exchanges and having that sort of ex, you know, experience with them. Um, once that happens, I'm really you know, <laughs> interested to see what, where they go because they are really a crazy sort of vehicle. Um, but up until now, you know, the only way you got them was if you invested in that early round with us, I gave you a ton of them. <laughs> and I only gave you a ton of them because at the end of the day, Nobody knew who we were. Nobody knew that we had what we had. Nobody knew that we were going to do what we were going to do. So we ended up doing that sort of thing. But at the end of it, one of the things that Henry has elucidated um, is that we are not positioned to actually succeed, even if somebody gave us a bunch of money right now, right? If you look at storage, and he shows in his chart right there that they literally own half of their coin supply, right? And it's crazy. It's all in a big lockbox, but they own half of it. They got 30 million bucks in 2017 on an ICO that's likely to be declared an ICO and, and, and an illegal 
uh, raise of money at some point when the CFTC and SEC finally do pull their bidding together. Well, they've got, you know, 250 million tokens plus whatever they already currently have in their hot wallets. So they're probably going to be okay, right? They'll probably claw back 30 million bucks from those guys and they'll say, okay, cool, no problem. We're moving forward. And they'll still have a hundred and some million of their own tokens in order to continue to do the, the subsidization and the incentivization that they need to do to do on their network. If you look at Filecoin, it's even worse. I mean, they got 900 million coins on a time lock over the course of the fully diluted uh, time span. But cripes, this is the market bottom. They're 96 or 97% down from there at the high. And that 900 million is worth something like $4 billion, right? So, you know, they're fine. <laughs> they're, they're in good shape, right? They're okay. Their coin was something like $240 at one point, right? So that 900 million was worth, you know, more than like most countries' GDP. <laughs> so, and, and there's only going to be like 1.9 billion coins. So they're going to have half of their supply. I don't know whether that's illegal or not. I don't know how the SEC and the CFTC is going to judge all that. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they may let them walk. They may let it all happen. I don't know. It, it'll do whatever it'll do. We took the other route. You can you can blame us. You can be angry at us. You can do whatever, or you can say it's a noble way to have gone. We took a permissionless uh, proof of work blockchain, and we let anybody who had a miner show up and come aboard and start mining coins right from scratch. And that's what they've done for the last four years. And that's how every single SCP, other than that original pre-mine where we gifted all those people over on SIA a bunch of coins, and then we built a treasury wallet that we could spend on you folks in network development. Um, everyone has been mined by a, a, an ASIC, right? An S11 or some other model that's out there. So, you know, we're proud of the fact that we have a true utility coin, and I think we're going to stand very cleanly when it comes time for you know the tune to be called from the USA. And I think this whole FTX debacle is going to make that tune pretty stiff. So I feel really good about that the thing we did. The problem of it is, is like right now we have four and a half million SCP, and we bought 1.1 million coins or 1.3 or some number like that over the last like nine months, right? So we don't have that kind of um, situation that those two projects have. And that means that we can't like make any mistakes along the way at all. And in fact, it also means that we're not going to be able to grow the network much beyond where it is right now. And if this was all, you know, if if getting to 3,000 providers was all we ever intended to do in 70 petabytes, well, that would be fine. But look, this is the thing that people here don't understand. The customer that we're targeting has multiple petabytes of, of capacity of storage that they need to put on that capacity, right? We're not talking about people that are going to be coming in with, you know, 40 or 50 terabytes, and that's the story. Yeah, we'll take those customers. We'll get a ton of them. But at the end of the day, the customers we're really going to be, you know, looking towards and which I think are going to be growing exponentially over coming years are the people that are going to have multiple petabytes of data. There's customers out there right now on Amazon that have exabytes of storage, by the way. There are some gigantic data consumers out there that essentially um, have filled these networks up and build that exponential scale that's coming over the next two decades. So. The deal to hear for us is, is we've got to find a way to reset the table. And um, the way that we have decided to reset that table is to focus it around the SPFs. I could have done a couple of things here, by the way. And if I was SPF, I probably would have done exactly these things. Um, I could have just printed another 50 million SCPs, right? And just given them to us. I mean, I really, 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 really would love to have a Dodge Ram F uh, what I can't even think of the model name now all of a sudden. That's how divorced I am from it. I could just print the money and go buy one if I want. But that's never been our thing. And that's never going to be our thing, right? We could do something where we demand that you all put 20x collateral on your machines and not pay you extra for it. Just say, look, if you want to get data, you have to collateralize it at 20 to 1. I could do that. And guess what that would do? That would cause you all to have to go out and buy a bunch of coins. And guess what? That would raise the coin price up 
to where ultimately our current wallets would start to have some value behind them again and we can grow the network. But again, it's not the right thing. So we haven't done it. Um, but the one that we are looking at doing right now is we are looking at changing the supply emission of the SPFs because it won't have impact too many people at all. And even the people that it does impact, we're going to accommodate to a degree. Um, they are going to take a bit of a hit, but you know they should have expected that. The deal is, is that there are 200 million SPFs right now, and those 200 million just live out there in space. And what they do is they collect 10% off of every contract. And so that 10% gets pulled into a, uh, a pool, and then that pool gets ultimately split up and then sent off to all of the individual addresses of the actual tokens. And then you actually have to do a weird thing. You have to move the coins from one address to another, and then they show up in your wallet. Huh. And it's not a lot of coins right now, right? Because there's two petabytes of storage on our network right now. So, you know, they're, they're shedding off some coins, but nothing near what it's going to be. These things are built ultimately for that future where people do come to us because we way outperform Amazon, because we are less expensive exponentially than Amazon, because we are the best cloud service with the nodes closest to your facility. When that kind of network capacity uh, starts growing up and then gets filled rapidly, those SPFs are going to become really, really, really significant things pulling off that money. Now see right now, it's a really interesting thing because we pay for all of that. You don't pay for it, right? You don't ever, nothing happens with you on the S SPFs. What happens is we put all the money into the contract to rent the storage on the network. And then at the end of the day, we pay both sides. We pay your side, we pay our side, and then that money gets distributed. Well, we hold a little bit more than half of the SPFs right now. These other people, the investors who were gifted the other half, so to speak, um, it's not quite half, it's probably closer to about 45%. But those people essentially, you know, get the rest of them. And so what happens is, as we're paying for this two petabytes uh, of, you know, test data, and as new uh, storage comes in from customers, and they start loading it up in there, we pay it, it's coming out of our wallets. So we're kind of paying ourselves, and we're paying our investors. And so that's, you know, been not a bad thing because the money's not big yet, right? It's still in that kind of phase where, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a thing, but it isn't a thing that really matters. So this is the time to do a change. And the change we've decided to make is going to create more of these units and it's going to make them available to more people. And it's going to put utility behind them in a way that they don't currently have right now. And it's probably going to make you want some. So what we're going to do is, and understand that everything I say from here forward is tentative. We still have to go through a shareholder meeting. I don't look for that to be adversarial, but if it does turn adversarial, I've already sort of gamed out a lot of different scenarios there. So we'll see how it goes. But um, we're pretty clear this is going to happen one way or the other. Um, and the deal is, is that we will change the emission of the SPFs from 200 million to 400 million. So now we will end up in a situation where that, you, you know, next 200 million will show up in our wallets and we'll start to look a little bit more like storage and Filecoin and being able to handle the oncoming growth. Um, all the way up to a million nodes, like somebody like Helium, right? We could never get to a Helium network size with the incentives we currently have. So this will provide a big, big, you know, test uh, bed of coins that we can use for those incentivizations going forward. We're going to call the coins, the tokens, two different names, SPFA and SPFB. SPFAs are the ones that are already out there and they will just remain what they are today. They, they are just going to stay as that, you know, uh, rent seeker. There will be a minor change made to them. I'll talk about that in just a second. SPFBs, on the other hand, though, are going to get a new capability or feature. And we think that's going to play out really interesting. So SPFBs will not actually pay out any SCPs unless they are tied to an active storage contract on the host side right? 
So let's say on an examiner, just for you know uh, argument's sake, if a, if an examiner has SPFBs on it, then those SPFBs will pay out the SCP um, token rent essentially going forward. So you know that's their deal. And then what happens is, let's say the user decides to take the unit offline for two months, and then you know storage contract fails, and they don't have a contract that's active, they won't pay out for that month, right? But then if they bring it back online and go active again, then it will come back on, there'll be a grace period, but then it'll come back on and then they will start earning again. So these units will always have to be tied to the network in order for them to gain the rent that they're going to gain. And that gives them utility. It gives them utility that we can work from, right? We can go ahead and then do sorts of things like governance, right? So later on down the road, at some point, this thing will turn into a uh, situation where the corp needs to start to divorce a little bit from the uh, crypto side of the house. And when we start moving towards changing from proof of work to proof of stake and some of those things, there's going to be a lot of things that will come up over time that will uh, benefit from having community governments. So similar to like a DAO in some ways. Um, and what will end up happening is, is that we could you know, apply a governance model to those things. We can apply like social proofing. So for instance, what ends up happening is if you put an SPFB on an examiner, you now have a really interesting situation because not only are you providing capacity and acting as a host on half of the protocol, um, and not only are you sort of making up this distributed data center, you're getting proceeds off of providing capacity, but if you think about it, in the current iteration, you're kind of like an Uber driver, right? You're like somebody who's come up with a car and now you're willing to go out and drive around and pick people up and then you get paid for that and it all comes through in the app and you're fine and happy with it. But you don't own any part of the network. You don't own any of the stuff. But if you have SPFB on that device, that device is actually now a part owner of the network. And let's think about that. So, so social proofing, when we start talking about people that really want to find, you know, the real valuable and really committed and really serious nodes on our network, the ones that aren't going anywhere. So ones that maybe governments might want to put stuff on, right? Go stuff where the, the data gets to be really serious and we need to be sure that kind of social proof of saying, well, look, I'm an owner of the network. And so you can trust your data on my node because my node ain't going anywhere. And that's the kind of thing we can apply to it. We can apply different uh, kinds of incentives going forward uh, against that token. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, the coins that are shed off of that can be used for anything. I mean, they can go any direction they want, but ultimately they will start probably by filling up the collateral needs and, and, and so forth. So that's kind of the thing. But then if you go and look on top of that, this is kind of what happens because this is the part that people don't really see because right now it's all a dream. But look, it is all a dream. But if you go back four years ago and you take like the first person I closed of those 24, the first, first person we sat down, I didn't even have a PowerPoint at that point. It was just me talking because I talk a lot, right? And that's what happens. And so what ends up in that conversation is we talk about all the, the, the benefits and the stuff, but what is it? It's all dreams. It's all just pie in the sky. And yet here we are four years later and look at what it is. We built the whole fucking thing. It's here. It works. It's performant. It's awesome. And you're all here, right? So um, this is what it looks like going forward. You start off with that examiner and now all of a sudden you've got, you know, a bunch of these SPF tokens on this thing. And yeah, over the next year, it's still going to be that thing. You know, you're looking at the income panel and you're going, man, when is this thing going to take off? You know, I'm not making all the money I need to make to get this Lambo in my garage, damn it. And, you know, it's that thing. And you know, if you've read Henry's article, and I know you have, and if you haven't read Henry's article on what kind of storage provider earn, you need to go out there right after this call and read that thing because it exactly tells you what you can expect to happen on this thing with some pretty high degree of confidence intervals. So if you think about how we expect it to go, years one, two, and three are probably going to be, you know, slow grind, slow build, data slowly gets put onto your devices. But then by the time you get to year three, four, and five, 
what you're going to start to see is that thing will exponentially tip upwards. Now, you might end up in a location where there's some big customer shows up and get a bunch of data quickly, but most people are going to see probably a pretty nice sloping chart into those later years. But then what happens is, is in those later years, once you start filling up your drives, those drives will start rewarding you with significant, you know, monthly revenues. And those significant monthly revenues in the out years are going to essentially dwarf the in years and you'll add them all up and divide them by 60. And you'll come up with an understanding that these things ROI three, four times and, and ultimately were very, very, very good investments. They weren't FTX tokens, right? They weren't nonsense. They were something providing a real service for real customers. What about the SPFs? Because they actually are pretty cool. Because if they just start out there just delivering, well, okay, there's, you know, looks like there's about, you know, 18 petabytes of storage on the network. Okay, it's all right. You're too. Yeah, those SPFs are doing okay. It's not bad. Um, but then all of a sudden you start to see the network start to really take off and we grow the network, you know, tons and we start getting customers all over the world and we start getting into year four and five. That's an exponential growth factor on that device. So if the device was already going to earn some, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a month just on the capacity and the incentives, those SPFs are most likely going to be delivering 10, 50, 100 X on top of it. Hang on a quick second. Sorry about that. Um, so that's really the thing. Putting these SPFs on these devices is sort of like supercharging. If it's like, you know, you're getting like the mega upgraded in some, you know, big game sort of that's being played here. And um, so I think that everybody's going to want to consider that very strongly going forward. Okay. So to get there, we have to do a couple of things. We have to do a hard fork. Um, our coders, our, our engineers are uh, putting the code together right now. We'll be going into a test net over the next several weeks. Then our goal is to get uh, software released out there. Everybody has to upgrade uh, prior to the fork. If you upgrade after the fork, I can guarantee you it's a nightmare. You're not going to like it. Um, so we will work with everybody to make sure that everybody's updated and upgraded before then. Our expectation is, is that we will run our test nets up into the middle of December with a target of doing the hard fork in the last week of December. So the week between Christmas and New Year's, we'll hope to pull that uh, hard fork off. Uh, we'll get all the mining pools updated and so forth. And then that hard fork will come off and these new tokens will be minted and pushed out and made available. Um, then there's one other piece that will happen at the same time. I'm going to get into some benefits and some special things that we're about to do with the SPFs. But before I get there, I need to talk about one other thing. So when we started the project, um, we had a thing in the early days where we said, well, you know, for every block, 20% will come out and we'll put it into a development wallet. And then those will go to the developers to sort of help defray some expenses. We, I think we were naive. We thought we were actually going to get some real money that we could like fund and self fund the, the, the development, you know, in those early years, but the coin never had any value. I mean, for those first two years, the coin was just totally worthless. There was no value at all. In the very first like month, there was value, but we didn't have any place to sell it in the first month. So you had to do it all OTC. After that, when we started getting on exchanges, that <laughs> it just went to nothing. And so, you know, yeah, we had a development fee, and but it wasn't really of any value. And so we gave it away. Right. We gave it all away. We we were running contests. We had things like Easter egg hunts. We had, you know, pretty cool and, you know, and education things. But at the end of it, it wasn't all that much money. And we had set it up early on so that the dev fee got stopped after, I think, block 30,000 or 105,000. I don't remember which one it was, but then it got turned around and sent to a burn address. Um, we made a mistake there. We should have kept those coins coming to the development team so that we could continue to use them for network development, which is exactly what we need right now. We need some extra coins for network development because as I told you, with the coin price where it is, we're gonna end up bankrupting all of the current project wallets over the next six months. We will no longer have any SCP on our side and we bought a million coins this year, right? 
So there's about a million five in the burn address right now. We are going to turn and target that back to the development, um, which will go directly into storage providers and network uh, rebates, incentives, and, and rent. So it's all for you. It's not for us. We're not going to go buy Dodge trucks. And I'll remember what those the three letters are at some point in this call. But uh, it's going to you folks. And it's just to ensure that we have enough SCP to pay you guys. Because what's happening right now is really something that's kind of weird. And it's not great. But there are a handful of people that truly understand what we're building here. And they are sacking away coins at numbers that you just don't believe. They have crazy amounts. And then there's everybody else who can't seem to hold on, want to hold on to even, you know, a few hundred. They get them and they just decide to get rid of them because they don't know if this thing's real. Well, you, you have to decide what you believe there. But what I'm telling you <laughs> is that these people that have, are really pulling all these coins together are going to end up holding this huge supply. And they're going to say at some point, sorry, we're not letting these go. You know, you're going to have to pay up if you want to get these back. The people that sold coins over the last year, you know, I've expressed disappointment and even anger in some cases. It, you know, I think it was a bad move. And I think if you're a stakeholder in the project and you sold coins in the last year, you probably don't want to talk to me. You probably never want to talk to me because you just, you, you made a big mistake. And now we're going to ultimately have to work to make that mistake whole. And I think we will, as we always do. And this thing that we're doing with a hard fork is part of that process of making it right and making it good so that we can win going forward. Even some of the people that invested, some of those 24 that invested didn't believe this was going to work. They were looking to get in and get out pretty quickly. That's not what this was. I never sold it as that. They had the wrong idea. I don't know. Whatever it is, they're going to have to live with it. And, you know, that's between them and their own you know, constitution. In our case, we know what we're building and, and we're well on our way to it. So that's the deal with that. So then what's going to happen between now and the end of the year is something pretty cool. First of all, on Black Friday, we're going to open up the store with a very special sale. Um, essentially, what will happen is for the next six to eight weeks, whatever it is into the end of the year, um, the only way to get these SPFBs will be to get units that have them attached to them or have purchased units in the past or have purchased full licenses in the past. If you have a $99 license, you're not going to get anything. So you might as well deal with that right now. The full licenses, the people that bought coins from Ian, the people that bought Examiners, the people that are going to buy in this new upcoming Black Friday sale, we have a plan for everybody. So the deal is, is that starting on Black Friday, we will have a new Examiner XM64 uh, version, I guess we'll call it. It's the same unit. It's still 64 terabyte, you know, flagship. The price is dropped to $27.95 for that unit. And the rebate structure on that is 25%. But the rebates now wow. on these units into the end of the year will only be an SPFB. And so... What we've decided to do there is we've decided to put a giant chunk of SPFB into every Examiner that is bought in that Black Friday sale. And then at the end of the year on December 31st, then the units will go back to having a normal amount of SPFB on them. So at this point, the numbers that we're looking at, and these are subject to change, but I think they're pretty close to what they're going to, to, to be at the end of it is a 64 terabyte unit will get 10,000 of these tokens and a uh, 16 terabyte unit will get 7,500. The price of the 16 terabyte unit is actually going up to 1795. So it's actually more in line with where it ought to be. And then um, those two devices will get those amounts of coins. They are paid out same as the current rebates, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. They are still there to encourage you to maintain uptime. So 95% is going to be necessary. If you don't keep your uptime up, you won't get them. And, you know, there's been some people disappointed by that now in the last couple of weeks. And there's going to be a bunch of people disappointed over the next two months if they don't keep their uptime up. 
So that's that, and that's the headline of this thing. And the whole idea, of course, is we want to generate more network growth. We're ready for it now. We can start bringing it in. We got the data live and up for sales. So we want to get back into a growth posture, and we need to fund the development team going forward. Plus, what we really need is we need marketing money. We need to get money out there so we can actually market the product out there to the real world. The other thing that we will be doing is we will be incentivizing the full licenses and we will be incentivizing the full upgrades. So those units will likely get in the neighborhood of 2,500 coins each or tokens each. And so um, that's a deal that is a way for you to get them as well to buy a new license going forward. Where you can get them if you already have purchased a unit, so if you're somebody from last December's big move, or if you're somebody who bought licenses over the last you know, uh, nine months since April when we started selling the big full licenses, um, you can actually, uh, and we'll set up a web page you know, in the console for you to make this decision. You can choose to convert the SCP rebates that you're currently uh, eligible for for SPFB rebates, and we will give you a significant quantity, more than you would normally get on a purchase of the SPFBs if you do do that transfer. And then ultimately, that way you can feel comfortable that, oh, hey, I already bought. How come I don't get you know cut in on this deal? If you're somebody that ended up buying uh, because you wanted to get the thousand incentives for me in and the other investors, um, or you bought uh, outright from them, um, those we are just going to make whole on a one-for-one -one basis to do, to remove the dilution. So if you were supposed to get a thousand there, you'll get another thousand to make for two thousand total. Um, and you know that just is what it is, and you, you can take that and run with it. But those won't be SPFBs; those will be SPFAs, the ones that make whole on the dilution. For people that bought. Um, and they're just a small handful of accredited investors that bought units and the people that were gifted them in the investor circle. I will be talking to you folks on Saturday and we'll explain what we expect to do there. The one other change that we expect to do on these units. So it's a two for one dilution from 200 million to 400 million, but we're raising the tax from 10% to 15%. So we're mitigating it to a degree that way. And what we're really doing there, by the way, that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because this is our road to Web3. This is how we get to Web3, right? One of the things that's happening now, we're in this big bear market. Everybody understands the, the S-curve of this thing now. They know where we're at. Everybody out there in the real world thinks that crypto's dead. They think this, this stuff is all shady. It's fake. FTX is the clear indicator. We're all going to zero. It's over, right? Well, anybody who's been here long enough understands how this, this works. This is exactly what we need to see right now, right? Because that means that only people that are going to be here are the people that are going to come out of the next wave with real products for real world use. And we're ready for that. We're ready for that. We are going to be one of the top dogs in the next, you know, whatever it is going forward because of the fact that we spent the last four years building a real product, suffering, not, not participating in the crazy, you know, bull runs that some of these crazy, you know, Shiba Inu tokens got and things like that. Literally, people were gambling on coins called the. I'm serious. So, you know, we're not that. We're something completely different. And this whole thing about bringing some utility to the SPFs is really exciting because it makes you owners of the network. And that's important. That's really important. So there it is. That's the exciting announcement for today. And I guess what we'll do now is we'll open it up for some comments and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, go ahead and let's see if there's any hands out there. Left them all speechless, Henry. Going <laughs> to drop the mic and walk now. Well, what I will, uh, what I will ask, just outright, um, can we expect a blog post at some point in the next, uh, I don't know, maybe week, so we're not having to come back and try and remember all these figures for the different use cases or situations? Yeah, we just got to talk to the guy who writes all the the cool blog posts. Oh yeah, Getting I think I can info. arrange a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Seriously, see... people, if you haven't been to the resources site and read any of the, the, the information we're putting out there right now, you really need to get there. One of the things that people need to understand is, so how come you're not marketing or how come you're not doing whatever? And, you know, and I tell you about the financial situation of the, of the corp and the, the team and so forth, but it doesn't mean we're standing still. One of the ways that we know that we have to market this thing going forward is it's got to be educational marketing. That's There's just no other answer to it, right? We've got to do case studies. We've got to do PDFs. We've got to do white papers. We've got to do all kinds of videos. We've got to do everything we can to teach people about this product. And then that's how we will attract the early adopters and the evangelist customers that ultimately will begin to get the groundswell going so that when the finances come into the company, when we get the funding for real marketing, when we really do get the thing off the ground. We've already got all those training materials. We've got already got all those educational materials and there's already a ton of them there. You, you got to go look and start reading through them because you're going to learn an awful lot about the project. And Henry's doing a whale of a job building them and getting them out quickly. So, um, Sorry about that. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, I do see uh, a question in the events channel. Um, so if you're someone who got a X minor early and you already have all the rebates received, uh, is there any way for you to get SPFB? Yeah, that's the one that's the one that we don't have a conclusive answer on right now. So we kind of have to think about how that works. Um, we can't just outright sell them to you that's that's sort of the whole uh component here so we have to figure out some kind of answer to that but i don't have an answer to it in this call and i expect that probably within the next couple of weeks we'll put something together that will be somewhat favorable there but yeah and 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 look it's not like we're you know punishing those folks because i'm really glad people bought x miners back then because back then nobody knew what it was going to look like nobody even knew if it was going to work and so you guys were early adopters and and we definitely do want to help you out um we'll work something out we'll figure out some way to make it work cool uh, we have a couple of people that uh want to come to the stage and ask a question so i'll extend the first one hey nikki how's it going you'll need to unmute uh, hello. I have one quick question. Uh, how do you think uh, the this new token uh, will uh, affect the price of the SCP token? Well, I think in the early going, it's not going to affect it at all because it doesn't. <clears throat> what happens is is that you have to own a lot of them right now in order for them to shed off enough SCP that would matter, right? I mean, you're not gonna earn enough off them today unless you own a huge, huge, huge number of them to be able to really impact the price. I don't really, you know, I, I didn't engage much when they were selling them in the channel, I because it wasn't my thing. Um, so I don't really know how much they were selling for. I don't, I don't, I always say to people, they don't have any value right? I know what they're worth, but they don't have any value. They don't have any formal value. They're, they've never been listed. We've never sold them to anybody. They, they just don't have that valuation. Um, but at some point in the future, obviously, once we get funded by Ventures, Series Seed or Series A, we will get them listed onto a major exchange. And then at that point, they will take on their own value. But what they do for SCP value, I don't think anything. I don't, you know, at some point, somebody might look and say, oh, yeah, this is a great vehicle that puts these guys in line. See, here, here's the thing. Henry puts this chart. Well, actually, D Dimitri put this chart. Well, a bunch of people put this chart together. And the chart's really cool because the chart shows that we've got this really performant, really large, really solid network. But we got this market cap that is a toy market cap compared to everybody else, right? We're like sitting here at $10 million on a market cap compared to these other projects that are, you know, hundred million and above. And in case of Filecoin, you know, billions and above. And everybody seems to think that's okay, right? Like, like, you know, don't, don't take it the wrong way. You guys are, it's a racket, you know, you guys just ought to deal with it. You know, you'll, you'll get there. Keep trying kid. And I just look at that and I go, yeah, okay, fine. 
I have to suck this up right now, but I don't have to suck it up forever. And when I don't have to suck it up anymore, I'm going to let you know about these days. But for now, what I'm saying to you is these things are completely divorced. They're, they're out there. And so what they give us is they give us an even footing now with Filecoin. They put us on an even footing with storage. They put us on an even footing with those people that are valued at 20, 30, 40, 100 times more than we are valued at. Now, if you look at that and you conclude that we don't deserve to be at the same market cap as those people, I can't, I can't say anything about that. That's not my job to tell you to change your mind about what we're worth. But I am telling you that the reasons for us to not be valued at the same value as those people are rapidly disappearing. And this token actually is sort of the last shoe to drop. So does it make SCP more valuable? I don't know. You'll have to make that decision yourself. Well, I uh, truly believe that we worth uh, more of the other competitors. But uh, here comes the dilemma. Uh, between our two tokens and i'm not sure from what i heard uh, how how can i decide which i have be more invested into and in which in what exact way i don't know well you're you know. going to have to make that decision but but the the equation is is you're going to have to think out two years three years five years and you're going to have to you know, make a decision about what you think is coming. And that's, you know, this is Warren Buffett investing. This isn't, you know, Sam Bankman Freed investing. So what happens is if we do all the things we think we're going to do, right? And you can at least give us some credit for our track record. Um, if we do these things, then the answer is really clear what you should do today. If you think there's a chance we're not going to do them, that these other people are going to fly ahead of us, that we're going to get outrun and outbid and out whatever, or that we're going to run out of money and get discouraged and leave, yeah, then your answer is pretty clear. Then you go the other way and you you say, no, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. But I, I think it's pretty easy myself. I, I don't know. Okay. We will discuss this further away in the chat, I guess, next week's. For sure. Thank you. There's a channel for it. Thanks. Hey, SG dude. How are you all right? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, good, good. Um, Ken, so thanks for that. I'm going to have to re-listen to the recording because I think I missed it a little bit. But can you just clarify, how are they going to be um, distributed? And also, you talked about an upgrade for examiners. I didn't quite understand that bit. They're not going to be distributed. They're only going to be offered as rebates against pending examiner sales, pending license sales, and the examiner sales and license sales that currently still have rebates outstanding against them. There is also a potential, which I still have to figure out how the process works, of taking care of the 150 to 175 examiners that have already totally received all of their rebates. But for the foreseeable future, and who knows, maybe even for the long term, the only way to get these things is to either pick up an examiner or pick up a full license. Um, they are never going to be sold by us. I can guarantee that, um, or at least never until we get some regulatory clarity. And there's just, you know, the, the primary way is to fund the network development. So yeah, buy a license, full license, or buy an examiner. Yeah, I've got an examiner. So um, so what, this upgrade that you were talking about, I didn't quite understand that bit either. Well, it's not really an upgrade. What you would do, so let's say, let's say you have R3 and R4 still coming, right? You can tell yeah. us you want to get it paid out in SPFB instead of SCP, and then for a limited period of time, people that do that are going to get a special amount. We're going to do more, right? Just like people that buy an examiner between now and the end of the year are going to get significantly more than people who buy an examiner next year when the market starts recovering and things are going good again and so forth. So um, if you have rebates still outstanding, we're going to put a thing in the console for you to say yes 
and then we will go ahead and turn your current rebate into SPFBs, and then that they'll just show up in your wallet on your Examiner. Okay, perfect. Because I'm pretty much in that position right now because I'm I'm in that batch one quota. So okay, cool. Looking forward to that. Cool. Cheers. Hey, DJ. Hey. Hey, thanks. Um, hey, so two questions. First, uh, with the uh, us who are running multiple DIY rigs, is it a reasonable assumption that it would be, as far as the SPFBs go, it would be kind of best to have them spread out um, equally amongst each other according to how much storage they're going to get or storage they're going to be using um, in order to maximize the profit on them? No, nah, not at all. This this is the beauty. This is the thing you need to understand what, what's on offer here. These units take revenues off the entire network. They're not tied at all to how much storage is on your devices. They're tied to how much storage is on the entire network. So from the standpoint of, of where they earn from, it can be from anywhere. Now, having said that, you may want to have them on multiple units just to provide that extra amount of social proof. And if next year we do get into governance or we get into, um, you know, special incentives or we do certain things for SPFB that we don't do for the rest of the population, there may be valid reasons. The only thing that matters is that they are tied to an active contract. They are on an address that is tied to an active contract. So, you know, any of your miners will suffice for that but there's really no reason to, to, to distribute them. And the other thing that we're working on um, that we will get going here pretty quickly is um, one of the things on the Exa miners that we know we need to do is a lock screen so that you can, you know, put a little bit more protection into the wallet if you're going to have additional um, assets and tokens in those wallets uh, while you're actually hosting a rig. Okay, cool. That makes sense. And my last question, uh, as far as um, adding additional drives to my machines and increasing the overall capacity, I mean, I've been looking at the numbers and seeing that um, the max most machines have on them as far as use capacity right now is about four terabytes. Um, but as far as expanding that, how useful is that to the network until we get to that point? Is it something that's uh, having, you know, me sitting there with 16 or 24 extra terabytes unused is of value to the network or value to me in advance? Or is that something that I can just, is probably best for me to do as I go and as the need comes out? Yeah, I, don't, I, think, we, I think we got to the place where we see the sort of utility kind of topping off to the, to the capacity uh, question. You know, we're already the second largest storage network in crypto at least, um, but it hasn't really, benefited us much to to go from one number to the next and so if we were to go from you know 65 petabytes up to 100 for instance yeah it's at some point it's going to be necessary but at this point i don't think it would cause anybody to 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 raise the coin price i mean we we're already pretty much re resolved to the fact that you know for whatever reason this is the market cap that people have assigned so you know, appearances aren't really going to change that. What we need to do is what we're doing, right? We, as Henry said, we've got four or five really good, what we'll call them as leads, right? We have people that we're currently working with to do early evangelist, early adopter type, you know, storage on the network. We've got processes in place to subsidize that, you know, to make it so that they can get in with no risk, no, no, you know, there, there's nothing you know, worried about, you know, losing. We've asked them to, you know, run side saddle and not drop what they're currently doing to, to, to use us to test it, to prove that it works. In exchange, we're asking them to let us case study them, white paper them, to use them as marketing materials. But here's the thing. I don't think that's going to go on for all that long, right? I, I think right now we're in this weird place where it's like, you know, who's going to be first. And we've got a couple of people actually using the network for real, but they're not using it in really big ways yet, right? They, they, they've got, you know, a handful of terabytes on the network. But I think what's going to end up happening is out of these handful of early adopter customers, some one, two, three, or four of those are going to realize, wow, why, what are we doing here? Let's get all our stuff over here. And, 
you know, when that starts to happen, I think the floodgates are going to open up pretty rapidly and pretty wide. We've got such a beautiful network and such a beautiful performance profile now that I just guarantee that once they actually see it in action, that, you know, once they try it, they're going to want to, you know, buy it. So, so I don't think the time today is to top those, those discs, but I don't think it's too far away either. Oh, no, this is, uh, this is really exciting stuff. I appreciate what you guys are doing. And yeah, it's pretty easy to, when needed, pretty easy to raise that amount on, on my end. So just want to be a, an optimal partner. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Hi, guys. For those of us that want to support, uh, what has a more positive impact on y'all, us buying a license or one of the storage devices? Well, I would say Examiner 64 is really the, the, um, best way to support the project. I'm surprised that we haven't had a lot of people sort of understand that. The benefit of the X, uh, the Examiner 64 terabyte unit is this. So not only does it drop a fair amount of funding into the, the, the project, but it leaves you in a situation that after you get the rebate, you know, in hand and you're ready to sort of do whatever, if this whole thing were to just melt away and we just failed, you'd still have four enterprise grade 16 terabyte drives that actually have maintained their value for the last year and a half. So, you know, it's really the no harm, no foul way to support the project the best. Full licenses are good too. You know, that's definitely something we want to do. And we do plan to continue to support the DIY community for now. Um, and then of course the 16 terabytes really were not really the best way to do it. Uh, that's why we ended up having to raise the price on those in order to make them actually work correctly in the the whole remuneration process. So 64 terabytes is the best way. Full license is probably second best way. 16 terabyte unit is probably the third best way. Uh, becoming a VC or an angel investor is a, a, a pretty good way, but you have to meet some hurdle type things there anyway. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll hear from Kotang. Hey, how's it going? Uh, just a quick question. My rebate's coming up on the uh, 24th for my 64 terabyte, and I was just basically wondering if that option to receive the other coin is going to be there by then. Yeah, I think what we're probably going to do, if you look at the rebate, um, like there's a chart we have internally that we we look at, and it's it's actually the nightmare chart that I look at, but it's a it's a chart that shows kind of where the hills and valleys are of rebates. And this last week that just went by started the big sort of deluge of R3 and R4. So we'll probably go back a couple of weeks and, and allow people a grace. But it'll probably also be tied directly to what we do to the people that already got all their rebates. We might, we might figure out an answer to cover those and then just say, look, you can convert all of your rebates if you like, or you can convert up to 50% of your rebates or something like that. But we'll... We'll have an answer for you, and and I think it'll be one that'll be satisfactory. Awesome. Appreciate it. That was it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, guys. This is Jacob. Hey, Jacob. So, Hi, Jacob. Um, maybe it's... Um, could you explain if a real customer wants to buy, let's say, 50 terabytes of storage on the XNS services, what is actually going to happen? So maybe some new guys here on the call would like to know a real customer, his Veeam installation, running our relayer, and now he wants to buy 50 terabytes a month. How is this actually being done by now? It's pretty much the way it works on um, most of the other clouds out there. The, the, I, I will kind of draw the line at the things having to do with IAM. So you know, being able to establish like an IT administrator root account and then doling out privileges isn't quite there yet. That's something we still have to develop. But um, what happens is, is that you stand up a relayer. It's really easy to set up a relayer now. There have been some kinks, but we continue to work through them and iterate through them. For IT people, you can set up a relayer in a lot of different ways. You can do it in a command line way. You can set it up as a UI on Windows. You can set it up in Linux. You can set it up as a straight containerized solution. So we're making relayers really easy to set up. Soon we'll be selling hardware relayers, which you can actually just buy uh, because we expect to abstract out a lot of services into the cache. But today, yeah. 
stand up a relayer. You just start uploading into whatever S3 application that you currently use. From our clone to any one of 50,000 apps out there, you just start uploading into S3. Once you hit 50 gigabytes, which is the free uh, monthly mm -hmm. stipend that we've given to everybody, then it just starts billing you. So you have to put a credit card in when you first sign up, even though you get the first 50 gig free. And yeah. then if you go and you only put up 25 gigabytes, you don't get charged. You don't get charged. You don't get charged. Then the minute you go over 50, then you get charged. So Let, let's say that he starts up with uh, 50 terabytes, terabytes. And then in a couple of months, he want to go down to 40. Is that possible for the customer buying? Whatever. Yeah, he doesn't have to do anything. He just that that billing all happens automatically. The billing engine will just keep oh. track of how much they use right up to the minute that they use it or don't use it. And ultimately, right. if they delete, then they they don't have to pay as much at the next month. Now, the one piece that's a little bit challenging is that the deleted files do remain on the storage providers, even though the contract, you know, uh, or the usage is no longer valid because the customer is no longer. They've said they've deleted them from the buckets, for instance. That's a mm -hmm. thing we have to add in the software in the coming time. But it doesn't affect you guys, and it doesn't affect the storage providers at all. It just affects the corp because we have to continue to pay for those, that, those terabytes right up until the contract yeah. change. But, is, but a feature, of course, coming from, <clears throat> from you to fix that, I, I guess. All right. So, so if the end customer actually holds any SCP, he can't use them. He can only use credit card. So our thought process and our belief system was that people don't like crypto, that, that there's a community mm -hmm. of people that are just falling down the rabbit hole, love it, that the rest of the world do, does not like it. And people that are in CIO, CTO, CISO, um, you know, CFO, CEO type positions mm -hmm. are not going to gamble long careers on the volatility and the craziness that is in crypto. So in our thing, we call it evolution then revolution. What we say is, is that people in these businesses are going to want to pay cash and get a real storage, you know, provider type environment that they're used to. Something like Backblaze, Wasabi, Amazon, yeah. whatever. But when it comes time to move to Web3, right, let's say two years from now, people are starting to say, well, you know, this crypto thing's not so bad and Bitcoin volatility is really, you know, evened out and our coin mm -hmm. market cap has zoomed up to where it's supposed to be. And everything is sort of now kind of like humming along and people do believe in crypto. Then we will move the contractor to one of two places. We'll either move it directly to the customer, which is easy for us to do. We could do it today, for instance. Or we will build a permissionless layer, stateless relayers where everybody can just use any contractor that, that, that they attach to and ultimately then go out and buy SCP on the open market and plug them into contracts themselves. Today, mm -hmm. that's not available purposely. It could be available if we wanted it, but it isn't available today. Now, I understand there's value yeah. in saying, well, yeah, but if you made it available, then people would buy coins and the coin price would go up. And yes, that's yeah. true, but it would expose a whole lot of different challenges in terms of people being able to upload anything and everything to the network, it would expose a whole bunch of challenges that we haven't yet solved in terms of the permissionless side of the decentralization. So our strategy I is I, I agree with one you. to two years on, of cash. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Go ahead. Um, no. Yeah, a few more questions. Let's say uh, some of us here on the call actually know someone with, let's say, 200 terabytes or one petabyte or two petabytes of storage. Are there any stairs on the price uh, in this, or it's just nine ninety nine a terabyte a month, no matter what happens? So we're right now in the process of working out a, uh, uh, a plan that will show up in the console for partners and for people that are bringing a certain kind of storage. So if it's archival type storage that doesn't have an overwhelming amount of API touches, and has a mm. you know reasonable amount of egress. So let's say they mm. upload 200 terabytes, and then over the next year, they maybe download 20 terabytes, right? So a yeah. one to ten type, you know, equation. Um, and they are willing to commit to some reasonable timeframes, you know, couple, three, six month type turnarounds. 
we will offer an, a lower price in the five to six to seven dollar range. And that's coming here probably within the next two or three weeks. Everybody we're dealing with right now, we're just giving free storage to and subsidization to get them on board to get them to try the thing out. If if a customer shows up tomorrow and says, well, look, I believe in it. And if you can get me the price at this, I'll commit to 200 terabytes. It's a working network and we're ready to go. We can right. do that today. And then we can actually have an agreement on a decent price. If we someone here on the call can bring a larger whale, they can call you and get a decent price. Absolutely. And not only that, That's but nice. really yeah, right yeah, yeah. now is the time to do it because we can tweak and tune the software directly for customers. We can mm -hmm. we can get people to show up and say, well, look, I need this or I need that. We can look at it and say, yeah, that's interesting because other customers will need that too. And so, yeah, definitely come to us. Great, great, great news. Um, just um, a final thing for me here, guys. Uh, so in, in the beginning of this call, you had some long talks about uh, the other storage, old Sire, Filecoin, coin and these guys. In my opinion, um, we should compare ourselves more like Wasabi and AWS. I know we talked about it, but when we talk, I know on this call, we understand everything you say, but customers don't understand Filecoin and storage and the other guys. They understand Wasabi, S3, and AWS. So I think that putting some more effort into comparing with something that they understand would be a, a great approach uh, on future calls as well. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And if you look at our mm. uh, pitch deck right now that we showed mm. to uh, Venture, we have one competitive slide, which is the crypto guys, and we have one competitive slide, which is yeah, the yeah. traditional incumbents. Oh. And that's a task for Henry to do next, where he's going to tear apart the, the you know traditional dudes and we'll make that same one or two page documents that we made for crypto guys, we'll also make for the traditional guys. So I would expect that to come up in the next several weeks and we'll probably have something online before the end of the year on that. All right, that was my five cents, see you tomorrow. Cool, thanks. Did we make it to the end, Henry? I think we did, unless, is Nikki really asking to come up for another question? And do you get two, two bites of the apple? I don't know, do you? Uh, yeah, we can hear him out. I want to ask how much tokens uh, you will get as rebates if tokens is not listed that uh, practically have no price and will be will it be guaranteed that the rebate you get like an early adopter will be more, worth more in dollars, let's say, against the scenario when you wait the new token to be listed and to buy from the exchange. Is there a scenario uh, when I wait and buy more quantity of the token from the exchange for my money instead of uh, getting it uh, through the incentives? Uh, don't get me wrong, I really would like to support the project by buying products from the corp, but if after that, when the token is listed, it happens that my investment costs less, less to be a bitter taste in my mouth, I guess. And uh, is there a mechanism that this possibility to be avoided uh, when we don't know what will be the price after the, uh, at the beginning when the tokens is listed? Normally, I would apply my customary snark to this kind of answer. But what I'm going to tell you is that you're asking for the you're asking me to take away the risk of the equation. And I don't have any way to take away the risk. You're here because you see value in a distributed process that is incentivized with a new kind of money. And that implies some level of risk taking. And if you see the value in the risk, then you'll come along for the ride. If you don't see the value in the risk, then you shouldn't put your money into it. And at the end of the day, if a year from now you come back and for whatever reason, it isn't you know the way you thought it was gonna be, it's what it is. It's just what it is. That's the way it works. Um, we're going to do everything in our power to make it the other way. But what we're not going to do is give you a risk-free way to make money because why would we and how would we and how could we even potentially do that in a way that would be even at all profitable for anybody in the process? Okay. Uh, can I just uh, ask one last question? Quick one. Uh, is there a problem and uh, when will be uh, when will we get uh, the 
Docker uh, full license because my all providers are Synology based Docker's and uh, Synology based uh, and Docker. So the the answer there is is sort of I'll answer the questions you didn't ask in that and and also answer the question you did ask. So we expect to release the Windows migration full license next week. We're going to get a couple of beta testers uh, to participate over the next day or two, and then we expect to have that go out the door. That is a Docker versioned uh, installation now. So um, that kind of set the stage for the question you did ask, which is when can we get Docker for uh, NAS? Well, it's actually possible today. You just need to be able to build the script to run it. and so. What we've talked about is is actually internally making a script possible to do that, where you just plug in your parameters and the script will be built. But what I think is going to more likely happen is, is over the next couple of weeks or even over this next week, we ought to be able to get somebody to write a guide on how to build that script so that you can actually go ahead and instantiate the Docker today because it works. You can set it up on QNAP or Synology right now in a Docker container you just have to get the script right in terms of what your storage looks like and and you know mount points and and all of that sort of stuff. So um, we do want to get an installer for it, but the installer really is nothing more than a Docker script that has the right command line um, parameters in it. So it's possible today. Okay, but uh, I really don't uh, don't feel ready to to try to to do. I understand myself. that, and that's why we're gonna get somebody to put together a guide on it until we could get an actual script writer, a script uh, machine to actually spit out the the parameters for you. We're gonna build a guide where you can walk through it, and then if it doesn't work, then you can obviously get Sparky or whoever on the line and, <laughs> and, uh, and get some and handling. After all, we would be available like uh, search and uh, get the image downloaded. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll just end up putting in a simple command line parameter and, and it'll cover all the specifics related to your thing. It'll download the latest Docker uh, image and fire up on your device. We have it running like that in, in internal ones. So it's, like I said, it's already a thing. It just needs to have the automation behind it so that's coming anyway that's it um appreciate everybody showing up today uh i think this is really exciting news i think we're going to do everything that's possible here to make this thing a winner i think we're really close to pulling it over the finish line it's really us that we would be exactly where we are right now the week that this other thing blew up and made crypto look like it's nothing more than a just a giant crazy scheme of people that are you know, scamming everybody of all their money. We're building something real. It's built. It works. We're in that place now where we can take the next step. Yeah, that's kind of been our thing. We've always been oppositional to everything else in this space. Well, that's okay because I think we're going to be the guys carrying the flag forward and you guys get to be here in that troop moving it up the road. And I just think that the next year or two are going to be the most exciting years of our lives and, and we all get to take real part in it. And again, thanks for showing up. And I would say see you next week, but I won't be here. So um, Henry is going to sing us out, I guess. Go ahead and take us out, Henry. Yep, thanks. So we'll be back in uh, two weeks. These calls are uh, now biweekly. So the next call, I think we can probably expect some kind of news and updates on some of the things that we discussed today. Uh, but that will the next call will also hopefully be a... Uh, a kind of themed call like we talked about on the last meetup that we had so uh haven't quite set out or decided of several I haven't decided which topic uh we'll begin with but it will hopefully be well we'll learn something next week <laughs> i mean we learn something every week but something related to storage providing specifically so thanks for coming everyone uh, of course uh we'll be in the discord uh if you need to talk to us or ask us anything but until then take care